Hello and welcome to Circle Time, the early years podcast with me, Glenn Denny. And I'm delighted that my guest on this edition of the program is the amazing nursery teacher, consultant, author, coach, trainer, general all-round nice guy, Mr. James Tunnell. James, hello, welcome. Good morning, Glenn. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely a pleasure. So, you know, we've we've talked plenty of times in the past and, um, you know, we've always had a great conversation. And I think today we're talking about culture and what that kind of means in terms of early years. Absolutely. So through my work, working with nurseries and schools, um, what, thing, what particular thing has come up again and again is how many people um, follow so what we call a Pinterest culture mm-hmm. um, they respond to things they see online um, and then things just don't seem to work in, in provision when they put things out and they're not really certain why and so something I've been doing for the last couple of years is to help practitioners tune into the individual culture what makes them unique in their particular area so for example um, you might have an inner city setting And you might have some children who are quite unique, quite different to children who might exist, perhaps in a more rural setting. The experiences that those children bring to the setting, the kind of conversations you can have with them, the the sort of trips and visits that they've had as well. You know, places have been, things have seen, all those things impact the kind of provision and practice that you can put in your setting itself. Um, I've got a little rainbow, Glenn. Can I go through my rainbow? Is that okay? Sounds excellent. I do love a good rainbow. (laughs) So... What I've done is I've broken the idea of culture into six different areas. It's not quite seven. I'm trying to make it seven. I've not quite got there yet. <laughs> but we've got six different areas that I think impact in terms of the considerations that you've got to put in place when you're designing your provision and your practice. So we've got children, parents and families, staff, leadership, environment and community. I'll go through each of those individually if that's OK. And I'll give you a little idea about what I mean by each of those. Absolutely. Um, before I start, I just want to make a point here that... I'm not necessarily prescribing that there's one particular sort of approach for your setting. I'm not necessarily saying that you've got to have X, Y, Z on your walls or X, Y, Z in your uh, provision itself. Um, You might put something out that, you know, is sort of run of the mill that does copy Pinterest, but it works for your children. And that's great. I think that's really important. You've tuned into what's important. Um, So let's start with children. So ideally, we would always be starting with children. That would be our starting point for anything that we put in our provision. I will say to practitioners, I was guilty myself for doing this as a teacher. Sometimes you do see something that you really want to celebrate with the children. You know, you might go to a festival at the weekend. You might go to see Santa at the weekend. You might have seen a really good TV program or film. And you want to bring that experience into your setting and you share it with the children, which is lovely. But it's not necessarily following on from their initial interest. Um, occasionally do that that's absolutely fine because the important thing is you're recognizing you yourself are, are an important factor in the culture in terms of what you bring to the setting but ideally most of the things that we do should start from the children so we have to think about what makes our children unique so we have to start off by thinking okay the children that we've got what are their language skills like do they have um english as additional language do they have a lot of vocabulary have they experienced Um, you know, interacting with lots of different materials and resources. Have your children, you know, have they been to a beach or a farm? I can't tell you the amount of times I used to take reception children to a farm and we'd drive past a field of sheep and they'd point out the window and say, lions, there's lions. And I just think, how, how do you get to the age of five and think that that sheep was a lion but the truth is you know being in an industry school they hadn't experienced seeing sheep it just wasn't part of their 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 lives to date i had a a group of children who um came with me on a bus uh, it was a public bus that was an actual experience in itself getting 15 children on the bus <laughs> um, <laughs> but i took the children to um a place in bradford so there's a place in in the center of bradford called city park and I can't really describe it any other way than it's just like a big puddle. Um, It's just like a a man-made pool of water. And at different times of the day, the water sort of recedes and you can go through different channels. Um, We took our children on the bus and we put them in their puddle suits, their wetsuits, and we went for a little paddle around. It was good fun. One of the little children turned to me and said, "Uh, Mr. T, is this the sea? 
and just hearing that was devastating to me because mm -hmm. it, I realized that that child had never experienced being on a beach and looking out at the vastness of the ocean in front of them. If our children don't have these experiences, it's very difficult for us to then create a lovely sort of beach setup in our water tray or a sand tray. You know, how can a child recreate making, you know, um, sandcastles with a bucket if they've never seen or experienced it? And then they don't necessarily have to have been there. They can see it through media, but their diet of the things that they're ex exposed to is quite channeled these days. And, you know, if it hasn't come up in Peppa Pig, some of our children will never have experienced it. And so their experiences are really important. Um, the kinds of experiences they've also had during COVID is super important. So we've all been saying it for quite a long time. There are many, many things that our children missed out on, whether that's socialising, learning to share, uh, yeah. spending time going to these different places. Um, and so some of our children, because they've had less experience with other children, the type of things that we put in our provision might need to reflect that. So we might need to have a few more resources so they don't have to share as, you know, they don't have to share one particular resource all the time. They can have mm -hmm. a couple of them. Um, but it also might mean that we as practitioners have to position ourselves there with our, with our you know, four and five-year-olds and demonstrate the very simple rudimentary idea around sharing things that usually you would reserve for two and three-year-olds, but they've missed out on that. And so we've got to spend time in the provision supporting that particular area. Um, and one last thing I'll mention about children is just this idea of interest. I know many of us follow interest-led planning, which is fantastic. Um, I've been doing a lot of work recently around um, people taking a step away from sort of the giant idea of um, interest. So, for example, you might see a child who's playing with a Batman toy. And they'll be running along and they'll be holding the Batman toy and the cape will be flowing in the wind and they'll be doing this side to side. Um, that interest for you, what you can bring to the provision, you might be inclined to think, actually, I want to bring in um, some superhero work, or superhero toys. But actually, that child's interest might be a little bit more rudimentary or a bit, a bit more subtle. That child's interest might actually simply be something flowing in the wind, flapping in the wind. Mm -hmm. or it could be that it's something moving from side to side. And so actually you might find that having something like a kite might be a much better interest to tap into than Batman. And so when I say interest, it's about not just taking what we see as a superficial interest and really sort of really getting deeper into those interests, really understanding as much as we can about that child, observing that child for a while before we make any enhancements based on those interests. Does children make sense to you, Glenn? Does that make sense to you as a practitioner? It does, yeah. I mean, th there's certain bits there as well I can relate. Yeah, having been a practitioner up in the Western Isles of Scotland, um, like you, you're on about the child that thought this was the sea when you went to when you took him to the park. Well, a lot of our children, uh, you were like, right, come on, let's all gather together and be a train. Well, there are no trains there. How can they join up and be a train? I mean, like you say, their nearest exposure to a train is watching Thomas. You know, it, it, that's as close to a train as some of them got at the time. You know, it, it, it's it's interesting that we don't always appreciate that a children might not have as much experience as us we need to kind of pair back and go what do they actually know where are they from and you know look at it from that starting point it's really interesting you mention a train because um when i was a teaching student i was working in ilkley which is for those of you not know, don't know the area ilkley is a standalone town but it's near bradford and i was in a play group and the children were taking on a train and you could go from one, Ilkley was the end stop, you could go from Ilkley to the next station, come back again. And it was just to give them the experience of being on a train. But I remember being on the platform with the children and some of the children turned to me when the train came in and said, that's not a train. And it was because their experience was Thomas Tank Engine. To them, they were expecting to see a steam train that was bright blue yeah. with, you know, Great big Clarence face on the Annabelle? end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um but to them seeing these electric trains was completely different to them that it was almost as if they'd been robbed of the experience <laughs> that they were expecting to have but the thing is you know being in ilkley all the parents tended to have cars or they might get a bus trains were just not part of their day to day i say this to people all the time about wheels on the bus you know when you sing wheels on the bus to the children do they actually understand what you might what you say when you say ring the bell do they understand that it's a button you press right. because actually very few of our children will have be on a bus, paid cash 
at supermarket. You know, we have these tills in our home corners, our role play areas, where we have money inside. But actually, the till is far removed from what we have. Most that's parents buy online. That's so, like, it's funny you say that. I don't. I actually have a card because our children don't know what money no. is. They, it, no. It's a bit of plastic. It's this magic bit of plastic that just pays for everything. I wish it did, but, you know. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's definitely that. It's like their real-life experiences now. What are they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the second aspect of culture, Glenn, is to think about parents and families. So we ourselves, obviously, we're not an island. We can't act separate from what happens around us. So we have to reflect what our parents want from us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to consider sort of where the parents are standing. Now, I've worked in some settings where parents have very very much been hands off, you know, where they've driven past the nursery slowly, open the car door, push the child and off the drive, you know, that very much a case of just going to the nursery, you'll be fine. I've had other parents who've been hiding around the corner for two hours and every so often they poke their head out and just say, get him to read his name because, you know, they're, they're desperate for you to do something with their child. Um, but it's really recognising these parents and how do we, how do we reflect and respond to the needs of the parents? So just a few things here I want to mention. Um, have you got some cash-rich, time-poor families? And by that I mean, do you have families that are not necessarily coming to pick up their child, a parent perhaps that you don't get to see very often, and perhaps there's a grandparent or a childminder or another wraparound person who's coming to pick the child up. And so any learning that's happening in your setting, is that being carried on at home? Or is there learning that's happening at home being carried on in nursery? Is there a two-way communication happening here? Because if you've got that cash-rich time poor, the family is the blessed of contact because they're doing the best job. They're probably catching up at the weekend, putting lots of experiences into their children. But you're acting separate to what's happening at home, and that doesn't really work. You've got to be able to build on what's happening at home and vice versa. And just another quick one I want to mention here about, about uh, parents is just general attitudes towards things like speaking and listening, writing, reading, I can't tell you the amount of times that people have brought their children to me in a school-based nursery and said, I'm bringing them to a school nursery because I want him to get ready for school. I want him to read. I want him to write. And I've just sat there ah. thinking, oh, exactly, <laughs> because your child can't even speak to me. They can't say a sentence. So why would they be ready to write? They're just not. And the thing is, there's a misunderstanding in there amongst parents that school-based nurseries have a different approach to other earlier settings. They don't. We're all the same. I, I, we all uh, yeah, I mean, we've had parents. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm in a PVI setting and it's we have parents like as soon as they hit like three four they're like oh and and they're gonna go to preschool now because they'll get them ready for school in what way do they do it different to us you know mm. it, it's yeah it's that perception in parents mind as well absolutely it's it's really difficult as well to explain to parents how important things like speaking and listening are as a foundation for everything else for reading and writing because parent culture that you know they talk to each other there's a lot of groups the the mix is I, I don't think we're ever going to break that what we can say is on an individual basis your child little johnny needs x y and z so he needs a lot of exposure to new experiences talking about textures because that's a missing part of his vocabulary at the moment so we have to be quite specific about that but recognizing that parents might have those high expectations and our provision and practice needs to balance those two off and so we give them the experiences but we share with parents what we've been doing so they can carry that on at home and um, the next part of culture is thinking about staff so there's a few different points here i you're going to pick a few out to focus on though mm -hmm. um i want to talk about attitude first of all many of us have amazing settings now you yourself you're you're based outside aren't you Gwen? um majority of it yeah so i'm a day nursery forest school and we do have times where we are out well i try to make sure we're outside every day for as long as possible and particularly in the cold weather just now uh, working with two-year-olds we're not out that long but you know we are still outside absolutely so things like uh, staff attitude towards things like outside mm -hmm. often you have staff members who don't really like it very much. I call them mug huggers, where they stand with like a, <laughs> a you know, the, the, the metal sort of cups oh, with yes. their tea in, and they're just they're almost sit on playground duty to join a school. They're sort of, you go and play, you go and play, and they're going to stand there. But that's not the point, is it? You've got to be part of the process. I've had staff who have come to me on a Monday and said, I'm on duty outside on Thursday. I've checked the forecast. It's going to rain. I don't want to go outside. And I just think, 
this is it's it's a, it's a baked in part of what we do. I appreciate. I don't want to force anyone outside if they don't want to go, but we've got to be really mindful of those attitudes and also the way that comes out of us and sort of imprints on the children. You know, if children hear that you don't want to go outside or it's cold or it's raining or even in different areas, like many people will say things like, I can't do maths. Don't ask me. Don't ask me. I'm not very good at maths. Mm. Children absorb those messages. It's so important that we recognise that because what we want children to be leaving us with is an attitude towards, you know, a positive attitude towards everything and not leaving us to go to reception or to year one. Say no, I don't like maths because that sets them up to fail for the next ten years of yeah. their life. You know they're going to be exposed to maths for at least the next ten years. Um, and another one I want to mention here is about staff interest. Now staff interest is often overlooked when we say we're you know in the moment planning or interest led, we forget about staff, which is a real shame because we all have a really powerful interest that should come into our provision. My last setting, I worked with a practitioner called Shabnam. We're still good friends. Shabnam loved to bake and cook. It was, it was a huge part of her personality. She has, um, she has a, a grown-up family now, but she spent her years as a young mum doing lots of baking and cooking, and she had the patience of a saint. <laughs> so for us in our setting, because she was so into baking, we baked any time the children asked. She would always say yes. Now I have the patience of a saint, but not that much. If I, <laughs> if I have to bake every day, I think I'll go insane because it's so difficult, isn't it? You know, the children might put out too much flour, too many eggs, drop something yeah. on the floor. She was great with it. She was brilliant. And you know, her interest was really unique because I didn't know anyone else who I've ever worked with who would be able to cope with that. But it's amazing. My my big interest is outdoor gardening. I love it. I've got an allotment. I'm really big on growing things. And so in my last school, we grew as much as we possibly could. And I taught my children the difference between a dandelion and an onion, which, by the way, Glenn, is one of the hardest things to teach children. I lost hundreds of onions. But the point is, I taught these children living in inner city Bradford. You know, they thought quavers grew on trees. I taught these children something about food and the journey that it takes. And, and that wouldn't happen with another practitioner. That was my interest that came out. Yeah. And so when we're designing our curriculum, our provision, our practice, we have to be mindful that staff interests are just as important as children's ones. Yeah. Let them shine through. Um, thinking really quickly about leadership, because I appreciate leadership could be a bit of a tricky thing to think about. It's nothing that we as practitioners can do much about in terms of the impact, but we have to just be mindful of a few things here. I, coming from the school sector, I've had head teachers who really get early years, which mm -hmm. is brilliant. Sometimes it's a bad thing because sometimes you just want to say something and you want them to accept it for what it is, but you know, if they've got an early years mind, they think, who oh, should you be doing that? Do I really need to buy that for you? Um, but in general, <laughs> most most head teachers I've had have come in, you know, at, on the first day of term, checked everyone's alive, and then they come back at the last day of term. That's it. You know, they're really hands off. Hmm. Now, when we are designing our provision, we need to really carefully think about um, sort of the bigger picture here. Now, you might be in a PBI setting, you might even be a lone practitioner, in which case you are the leader itself. And um, when we want to do something in our provision, our leader might have a more global priority. So the example I would give you is, as a setting, as a nursery, you might know that you need to be raising the language skills of your children up because you know that they are quite low. Across all your rooms, you want to raise language skills up. But as a practitioner, what you really want to do is you really want to get into designing your outdoors and make it really bright and beautiful and colourful and great and exciting. And your leader might say, I love that idea, but I need you to think a little bit more about language. Sometimes we come up against a bigger priority. We've just got to be pragmatic. We've got to recognise that we've got to work with our team. We've got to work with our leader who has that bigger picture in mind. Um, I've got two more points. Glenn, are you okay for me to keep going through? Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. So um, environment is the next one. So in terms of environment, just a few things to consider. Things like, have you got really high display boards? Are they purposeful? Are they actually making any difference whatsoever to your setting? If you've got a display board that you need to get up a step ladder to get to, the chances are it's not going to be meaningful for the children. I would say take it off the wall or stick some, just stick some paper on it and leave it. Um, have you got too much furniture? And um, that does make an impact mm. in terms of what you can do in your space. You know, if you want to develop that kinesthesia, that movement skill, um, you're not going to be able to do that if you've got lots of things packed into your space. Yeah. But a really big point I want to mention, this is really pertinent for term time based practitioners, is the sustainability of our energy. So if we spend 
uh, maybe the summer holidays if you are closed or to be the Christmas holidays or even just maybe one evening if you spend quite a lot of time making your reading area amazing with um, a pair of boots hanging from a cloud on the ceiling with footprints all over the place with a golden chicken in the corner with a, a rainbow across the side of the display if you've done all those amazing things and spent weeks doing them brilliant you've put a lot of effort into an area you've, in, you've set up your continuous provision but then when you get to Christmas and it's time to redo the area but at the Christmas, you've also got reports to do, nativities to do, your shopping to do. You've got a child who's just starting. You've got a million other things to think about. And suddenly, that two weeks that you spent on the reading area in the summer, compared to the two minutes you can spend at Christmas, yeah. there's a, a, a disparity there. There's a you know that doesn't match up. You have to be able to spend as much time in developing, enhancing each of your provisionaries throughout the year, and so. I see a lot of the time with school-based practitioners, they make the classroom look amazing in January, but by the time it gets to Christmas, it's all run down. And their response is, I don't have time to yeah. make it look like it used to look. And the problem is, for our children, they are fed a diet at the beginning of the year of, this is what our provision should look like. But when it's run down by Christmas, no wonder they don't want to interact with it. And so I'm not saying make it drab and boring in September. What I'm saying is put the bare bones in place, build it up very slowly with the children throughout the year, let them take ownership. And then when you get to those difficult times, like at Christmas, they can take a little bit of that pressure off you by putting things in they want to. Or it just stays as it is for a little bit and then you, you, know, you develop it when you've got a little bit more time. The last point, Glenn, is thinking about community. So here I'm really thinking about the, the families that live beyond your walls, beyond your gates. Now, you might serve a particularly large community or a very sparsely spread out community. I imagine in your previous setting in Scotland, yours was quite spread out, but I imagine they're quite similar in terms of maybe where they lived or the kind of experiences that they had. Yeah. But what we need to be tuning into is what kind of shops do our children shop in? What kind of experiences do they have immediately in the environment? Do they go to a mosque? Do they go to a church? Do they go to a temple? Do they go to a particular shopping centre? Do they stay up really late? Do they go to different restaurants? Do they do different things that we, as teachers, as, as grown-ups, wouldn't necessarily experience? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if your child goes and shops at an Asian supermarket or an Eastern European supermarket, buy foods from those shops bring them in to your provision so they can see the labels. A child cannot role play with something that they've never experienced before. So if you've got in something like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and they've never seen it before, well, it's just going to be a box, you know, unless they can look yeah. at the picture and really work it out. They need to be able to play with what they know. And um, I was working with a setting, it's a setting in, in Vietnam, actually, we're talking about snow. And I said to him, I love the idea that you're putting snow in your tough spot tray, but you keep telling me that it's really warm. And I said, oh, no, they've never seen the snow before, unless they live in the far north of the country. So I said, well, we need to think about the things we're putting in need to be part of their lives. You know, we can put provocations and new things in, but we have to be quite mindful. It can't just be something that we just, you know, dump somewhere on one day and hope it will be used. Um, and then thinking as well about your amenities, just the last point here is, you know, if you want children to role play a shop, like we mentioned, well, what kind of shop do they have access to? Is it a self-service? Um, you know, if they want them to post a letter and role play, you know, wrapping a parcel, have they been to a post office? What is the point in talking about a baker's and a butcher's and a fishmonger's if they've never seen those things? You will have to expose the children to them before you can bring those things out in your play. Definitely. I mean, it's, you were talking about like the island community that I lived on and obviously now I live in York and I've got a very different kind of community where children I mean where I am I'm just outside the city centre so a lot of our children have rural setting and there's so many different cultures coming in we've got children that live on farms we've got uh, children that live in big houses we've got children that live in little houses you know there's all that coming in and all those experiences and it's amazing that we can actually share that with each other not just with the adults but with the other children as well so the other children get to know about these things it's like well I don't have a bite like that I, I I have a bite like this you know there's all these different things and they start talking about it and those shared experiences become really really powerful absolutely there's a, a setting I work with um, on the Isle of Man, and they like to use the phrase home from home. And I say, your your continuous provision should be as closely matched to what they experience at home to begin with as possible, so that we know they can come in, be comfortable, and to learn in a comfortable, familiar surrounding. 
On top of that, your enhancements are the seeding that you're doing in a provision. They can be those different experiences and new things. Take them to the shop, show them what you mean, take them to the post, that's brilliant. But remember that many of our children will not experience the things that we as children will have experienced or perhaps completely different things. And so we have to work with who we've got. We can't be leading based on the staff exclusively. We've got to lead from the children first of all. Absolutely. I mean, it was something else you touched on much earlier when we were talking. Um, and I've seen it a lot from practitioners where they are literally glued to Pinterest. Like you say, there's some useful bits on there, but it's got to match what the children are interested in, what the children need. But there's other practitioners I've seen where they've got, oh, I've set this up from Pinterest. It looks amazing. Please take that word look out of there. It's not about the look. It's about what can be done with it. What do the children get from it as well? And it's just, yeah, it's, it, it can be a dangerous thing. It's, you know, I've worked in settings as well where it's just completely, you know, twinkle-fied everywhere, you know. And now, you know, having been a user of that certain website, I now cringe at the thought of just printing stuff up and sticking it. It's like, what purpose is it? Absolutely. Don't get us wrong, and we'll both show this caveat, I'm sure. There actually are good things on Twinkle. Like, if you wanted just, like, something quick that you would make yourself a publisher on Word, great. But the problem is a lot of people go on these websites and they look for things and think, oh, that's nice, That's as if they're shopping. But actually, that's not the point, is it? The, you're meant to go on and find the thing that you're specifically looking for to yeah. save yourself some time. And um, Have we got time for me to talk really quickly about play diet? That's a little bit of an extra Absolutely, yeah. This. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. So, play diet is something relatively new I've been talking about recently. It really is about delving a bit deeper into what our children have got and what they've um, been experiencing at home or the kind of things we have to think about in terms of resources for our children. And this is in direct response to a um, great many settings who have moved away from plastic towards lovely teapots and shiny kettles. And don't get me wrong, beautiful resources. However, I spend almost all of my time now as a coach, client, consultant, give me another word. <laughs> I spend almost all of my time going in, looking at these beautifully set up settings and thinking, well, where are the things that the children are used to playing with? And that's what I mean about play diet. If you've got children coming to you from a home where they have plastic toy cars, a garage, and action men Barbie dolls, um, actually, you know, uh, sold toy soldiers, the tip atypical toys that a lot of children yeah. from our communities will have had. If you've got those things at home and suddenly they're coming to us, they're coming to what I call Granny's house. Like there's an ornament over there. I know I'm not allowed to touch that. Suddenly oh. you're rubbing up, you're not meeting children where they're at. Yeah. We have to be mindful of the diet our children have had, the play diet they've had. And so our provision should have some of the things that they've had at home. Now, you might not want army men. Absolutely fine. That's okay. Pick something that you know they've had. You've done your home visit. You've done your transitional talk. You've seen that they're really loving, and I mean loving, these really big um, sort of, you know, bingo marker sort of colouring in pens. Yes. You can get from B&M. They absolutely love them. I'm going to go and get a set of those because I want that child, when they come in, to be able to do what they do at home and for me to help and teach them even more. That's our job. Our job isn't to make this round peg fit into the square hole that we've created of a provision. Now, I'm not criticising people who've chosen to have bright, shiny, beautiful, but you have to remember, if your children don't have bright, shiny, beautiful at home, you have to enhance your provision with more of the things that they're used to. Yeah. Otherwise, the play diet is just not being considered at all. No, I think we were like that as well, like because of the the, the, the method that we follow um, in my current setting. it's We're very much about, you know, granny's house lives here kind of thing. But again, we enhance that with things that the children are familiar with. So we have our cars, we have our trucks, you know, we have dolls and we have all the kinds of things that they're used to but we just don't have a huge amount. We've got, I feel we've got that balance between introducing new things to them that they maybe haven't experienced, those lovely little shiny resources that they, they might want to play with, but also we've got the familiar. So we've got them there with familiar and then we're encouraging them to try the new and unfamiliar. And, and that's what it's about, like bringing in those new experiences. Absolutely. There's nothing at all wrong with a good provocation, with a good sort of line of inquiry, we shouldn't have 50 of them on the go at the same time. You mm -hmm. know, you start off meeting the children where they're at, and your provision looks as much 
as possible, like the kinds of provision they would have at home. And you build and you go on a journey with them. You bring in that, that lovely shiny teapot that they've never seen. They're the ones from the 70s restaurants. You bring that in, you put it on the table, you talk about it, you put something in it, oh, it's got warm. You put something else in it, you think, oh, it's really heavy now. All those things are really good for investigating. And then, yeah, great, it becomes part of your provision. Mm -hmm. But it's not just plunk down and and children, you know, look at it for three weeks and then it gets dusty and you've got to dust it down again it's got to be part of the learning there's got to be a reason why you put these things out yeah um otherwise you might as well just take the children to a museum yeah no definitely well james thank you so much for coming to talk to us today it's been absolutely brilliant and like the play diet and then also the rainbow as well brilliant ways of looking at things and ensuring that we're really putting the child at the center of everything that we do Thanks, Graham. If people do want to find out more, because there's, there's an awful lot of stuff that I've missed out there because it's quite a long process, um, they can go to my website, nurserynook.co.uk, or they can reach me on social media. I'm Nursery Nook. Um, I talk about this quite a lot. That This part of my training is free because I want people to hear about it and get the message through. Um, reach out to me if you've got any questions as well. That's brilliant. James, thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. And don't forget to join us for another edition of Circle Time, the Early Years Podcast.